Welcome, and thank you for joining us today to learn more about how TE is engineering tomorrow's wearable. I'm Kristen Miller, and I'm talking today to Nick Langston, Jr. out of our uh, TE Wearables Lab in Menlo Park, California. Nick is the head of the lab. Hi, Nick. Hi, Kristen. To get us started, can you tell us a bit about your background and what led to your involvement in engineering and now TE's wearables lab? Sure. Uh, I lived in the Bay Area here for about 30 years and came up in small companies. Um, my father and I started a company together doing semiconductor test equipment and everything from design products, uh, mechanical products that were custom machines to uh, build sales organizations and uh, machine shops, and eventually found my way here to TE to help lead this team. Great, thank you. So what is the next big space or industry that wearables will be revolutionizing? It's a great question, and it's a big question that everybody's trying to answer. So I'll start out by saying, you know, take my answer with a grain of salt. I wouldn't place any bets. but. What we do see coming is that all these things that have been hard devices, whether you know, watches or wristbands or other hard things, are now wanting to get closer to our bodies, wanting to understand more about what's going on on the person. And because of that, you can't keep putting these hard things all over soft people. So the devices and the environment that the sensors are going to be in is going to become increasingly softer. For us, that means beginning to look at smart clothing, which we really think is going to be the next big wave in wearables. Sensors are going to move out of wristbands, even out of eyewear, and start moving into our shirts and our pants and other things. Okay. So um, switching gears a little bit, how do you, and now that we're thinking about back to school right now, since it's August, and uh, people are getting back to go, getting ready to go back to school. How do you see wearables impacting and shaping education? It's a huge opportunity, and I think it'll take a while to play out. But if you think about what technology has done for education, obviously first with books, but then with videos, and then with different kinds of rich media available to students, there's a lot of different things that wearables could offer particularly augmented reality and virtual reality. If you can imagine the experience of, you know, we read about Gettysburg or we read about different events in history, what if you could actually put on some augmented reality, uh, an augmented reality headset and see for yourself some of these images in full 3D, a really immersive experience to help you understand what that's like. Even more practical applications outside of history, even learning uh, particular skills in engineering, being able to manipulate gears or other parts of a complex mechanical system, or biology, being able to explore the body, having gloves that were linked to the eyewear so you can actually feel like you're manipulating the things in your environment. That's a really, really big opportunity. I think it'll be three to five years before we start seeing that but the implications of it are really tremendous. There's a lot that could be done with it there. Yeah, you're right. And speaking of biology, um, looking at a different field that may be impact, um, what do you think is next for wearables in the medical space? That's a big one that's waiting to happen. And uh, obviously with anything, any device that's going to be used to diagnose a condition, um, it takes a lot of time for those products to go through the appropriate testing and get regulatory plans. But what we do see is that people are using activity monitors a lot. That's valuable data for medicine. Uh, if, and the question around it now is really around privacy and who owns all of this data. So you can imagine bringing to your doctor all of your data from your Fitbit or from your job or from whatever other activity monitor you might be using. It's tracking your sleep, it's tracking your steps. That gives a doctor a pretty good indication of how active you are, and that can be used to help feed their diagnosis to you. But in genuine medical applications, there's a tremendous opportunity to get patients out of the hospital more quickly to recover at home. 
And we know just keeping people in the hospital increases their chances for contracting another illness or something. So if we can get people out of the hospital faster, then we can allow them to recover better. We can enable that by putting sensors into clothing or having more comfortable wearables that could do some of the monitoring of vital statistics remotely. You can make these sensors available in wearables in really unobtrusive ways, invisible ways, that allow them to just kind of fall into the background of the user's life. Then you can be getting real-time monitoring going on at the hospital of these patients that were just released. You can tell them, the doctor could respond in real time and say, hey, I asked you to walk around for 30 minutes a day. You didn't get up at all yesterday. What's wrong? Um, you can get immediate feedback like that. And that actually probably is one of the biggest implications of wearables. There's other things about um, how the data analysis is going to contribute to wearables. When you think about artificial intelligence and its maturing, if you combine the sensing that's in wearable devices today with the capacity for, I'll just say, the cloud to take advantage of all the new research that's being generated in medicine every day and using artificial intelligence to parse that data, you can actually reach a point where the cloud could be able to better diagnose a condition than any one doctor who simply can't keep track of all the new research coming up all the time. So you can imagine in the future that between your wearable devices and your smart home and your connected car, you, you begin to get an environment that's sensing a lot of information about you. If the cloud can process that information in a way that's really useful to the individuals and to doctors, that could transform a lot about medicine. Going to see a doctor could become as unusual as going to see a cobbler. You know, you do it if you absolutely have to, but the ecosystem matures in a way that it isn't always necessary. Thanks, Nick. That's interesting probably to all of us, right? Um, something else that might be interesting to everyone, uh, how do you think traditional wearables like hearing aids and watches and even earrings will be transformed by this technology that you're working on? That's a really good question. Um, watches in particular, because that's a wearable that everybody's familiar with. Uh, hearing aids, you can think of that as really the, the original piece of wearable technology. But um, I think the transformation is going to occur around the inclusion of sensors to get a little bit of additional information. Hearing aids a great example of a piece of technology that's worn and has really improved quite a bit over the last few years. People who are wearing them can now also add potentially optical heart rate sensing so that you can sense your pulse through the ear. That's an interesting way to just extend the benefit of having that kind of a device. There's other things that could be done. Certainly we see people beginning to look at jewelry a different way and saying, could we push notifications out to a ring? Could we push notifications out to a bracelet? Could we use those devices? intrigued is the watch devices to some other things of being everybody's talked about smartwatches now for a while. And there's always going to be a portion of the population who wants really cool smartwatches with a nice big LED screen, OLED screen, an operating system and all that. But there's another portion of the population that doesn't want that, that likes the classic Swiss watch, so to speak. That's a really interesting uh, dynamic to be watching right now as these traditional watchmakers whose value really resides in their ability to produce these beautifully complex and precise mechanical pieces that people wear as jewelry. How are they going to react to the, the addition of sensors or the addition of extra intelligence and functionality in this market? There's um, just beginning to see some of these new options come out. Um, there's a company that's been involved in wearables for a while called uh, Full Power. They're a company that creates sensing platforms. They worked with Jawbone and other people to create sensing platforms from them. They're now working with the Swiss watch industry to help enable some additional functionality in these traditional mechanical watches. 
what they talk about is really, in my mind, it's a new generation of movement. They call the mechanics of these watches, the movement. They're talking about a, a really a new generation of movement for a new generation of buyers, where you take the traditional mechanics of the watch, but you add some sensing in there, so it can keep track of your steps, but it is still really a mechanical watch. I think Mondan just introduced one of these watches based on this new technology. It's, uh, it looks for all intents and purposes like a traditional Swiss watch. It's a nice big metal piece of jewelry. I think the way that part of the market evolves is going to be very interesting to watch because it appeals to a different consumer than something like the Apple Watch would appeal to. And that creates some really interesting opportunities to deploy sensing. Something else uh, we've learned, in particular talking to the watch industry, is um, these Swiss watches, they see their value as the mechanics of the watch. They really are, are very careful about changing that or altering that in any way because you know Swiss watches are expensive. That's what their customers are paying for. But they also look at their wristband as a new opportunity to extend some functionality. Wristbands on traditional watches are interchangeable. You can just trade them out as, as your fashion tastes change. What if you could add functionality to the wristband? Like uh, an NFC antenna, so you could do mobile payments with your traditional Swiss watch. Maybe that'll be interesting to some people. Looks like a regular watch, but you can tap it just like you can tap your Apple Watch or some other thing. Beginning to explore that has become very interesting. It's also an example of where the connectivity is a challenge because a, a wristband, this is an example of a, a simple uh, plastic wristband from a watch. This is a soft environment. You're not used to putting hard things in here. This drives the need for flexible batteries and flexible interconnects to go inside these systems. And that's something that our team here is looking at and exploring uh, quite a bit. Yes, and you just uh, touched on it, but when it comes to connectivity and wearables, we hear a lot about miniaturization, of course, and you were recently spoke with ECN about uh, the need for wireless power. What are the big trends for connectivity and wearables right now? For the most part, it, it kind of follows the same path as a lot of consumer electronics. That, that is, let's make it smaller, let's make it thinner, and let's make it waterproof. Those drive a lot of the, the demands for that. But what also is happening is that because we're creating different kinds of devices that we're using in different ways, the whole question of connectivity is being opened up saying, why do we want any openings in these devices at all? Why don't we just close the whole thing off? And that allows us to create really new radical forms. That's why we think wireless power is going to be really important in wearables. Because for most products, that's the only reason you need any kind of plug on it at all is to charge the battery. Most of these devices are using Bluetooth already. You only put a plug in there so you can charge it. So we've been working on developing really small wireless power solutions. This is an example of one of our receivers, very thin, very small. So you can easily integrate it into something like a smartwatch or a wristband. We've even worked on developing conductive inks that can be ironed into garments. This is actually a wireless power coil that we deployed in a jacket. So the jacket has some other electronics on it. When you put it on the coat hanger, this coil helps allow it to pick up a charge from the coat hanger. So the, the smarts that are embedded into the jacket can begin charging. It's looking at these different kinds of applications that brings up a lot of questions. It's not clear what direction the market is going to go, but it is clear that cords aren't part of it. We do say that if you're going to wear it, you're probably not going to plug it in. There just isn't, a, a, it's not normal for users to have to plug in things they wear. And eventually, the market's going to demand that we get away from that. It's also driven a lot of interest in energy harvesting. And uh, TE is a producer of piezoelectric films that can be used to harvest a little bit of energy. We're also looking at RF energy scavenging. That is just taking some of the radiation that exists around us through Wi-Fi or other means and grabbing a little bit of that to help extend battery life in devices. These are uh, really some of the, the kind of cutting edge technologies that people are looking at 
in terms of what helps enable the new shapes and wearables and the new forms and what allows industrial designers and product designers to do new things. These are particularly important as we start looking at smart clothing, and smart textile applications, where you, the last thing you want in a shirt is a micro USB plug that you have to worry about. It has to pick up a charge some other way. And we think wireless power is really important to do that. That said, you know, miniaturization is important. We've been working on a, a new kind of family of board to board and board to flex connectors. I'll attempt to show how small this is. This is the connector here. It's probably about the smallest thing you can find. It's about 0.35 millimeters when you put both halves of it together. This is ideal for wearable applications, in part because it's so thin, but also because we use a manufacturing process that really doesn't require any significant tool. That means we talk about wearables requiring flexibility. Flexible is both physically flexible, but it's also customizable. And this kind of board-to-board -board connector series is going to be inherently customizable. You want a full grid or a full matrix of contacts? We can do that. You want a custom pattern of interstitial contacts? We can do that. You want just a few pins? We can do that too. And it doesn't add a significant amount of cost to the connector. Usually if we have to customize something like a board-to-board -board connector, there's a, a pretty significant hefty tooling investment required to do that. This new connector line, which we call our film connector, isn't going to require that. And it's going to enable our customers to have the flexibility they really have been asking for in their designs. Thanks, Nick. While you were showing some of those examples, we had a question come in um, from Ted. And he asked, when embedded, are these washable or washing machine proof? Yeah, that's an important question. And it's turning out that washability is one of the most difficult tests to pass. There are standard tests, and our latest capital equipment purchase was a washing machine that we have in our lab now. So we're doing regular testing of connector prototypes to understand, well, not even just the connector prototypes, of the conductive mediums themselves. People use uh, plated threads, people use conductive polymers, people are using a variety of different conductors in garments to understand, uh, to do ECG monitoring, mostly heart rate monitoring. We're putting a, a variety of these different materials through wash tests with our connectors to understand how well does our connector hold up, how well does that particular conductor hold up when mated with our connector and gone through 50 or 100 cycles in the wash. It's been very interesting. We're also finding that textile manufacturers are very interested in working with us on this. They keep coming back to us saying uh, their customers are telling them they need better connector options, and they're happy to see a, a company like TE working on them. So washability, yes, it's a very significant problem. Dry cleaning is a particular problem in the U.S. We do dry cleaning differently than most of the world. We still use some greenhouse chemicals in our dry cleaning. And uh, trying to make sure we deliver a solution that can survive any kind of washing, whether it's at home or commercial washing, uh, is one of our targets. And we're well on our way to completing that. Sorry about that. Thanks, Nick. Um, we had another one come in about the examples. Um, if you can touch on it from Lorenzo. Um, he says, Nick, how is how the ink is ready for placement on textiles? Is it available now, or is it still in the research stage? If that's the Lorenzo, I think it is. Tell him hi from me, and uh, I missed him in New York this year. Sorry we couldn't get together. Um, the ink is something that our corporate R&D partners have been working on for a little while. Um, it isn't something we're producing in high volume at the moment, but we are using it to produce Bluetooth antenna designs now, particularly in smartwatches. And this gives me an opportunity to talk about the challenge of putting antennas in smartwatches. As we mentioned, you know, people want, really, there's a tremendous demand for the traditional watch, not a plastic molded watch. People like metal. So what we've had to understand is the challenge of putting an antenna in metal. Putting an antenna in a watch is like putting it in a box that the antenna signal can't get into or out of. So we've used our conductive inks to 
print an antenna on what we simulate here as the watch glass. This is a prototype we made of a watch, just a metal enclosure. And we have the watch glass here with uh, a piece of metal representing the LCD screen that would interfere with the antenna. What you can't see here really well is that we've put an antenna pattern, printed it on the glass here. This actually gets better antenna performance than really any other way of deploying an antenna in a watch. We've been very successful with this, and now we're actually working with some customers to start delivering that in high volume. The antenna for textiles is different. We're actually trying to understand which is better, a conductive ink or a conductive thread. It really depends on what the antenna is going to be used for. If it's going to be used to transfer power, you really want as much metal as you can get. And it may actually make sense to deploy wires into the textile to get that kind of power. If you're just trying to, to get Bluetooth data or GPS data uh, across an antenna, conductive ink may be one of the best ways to do that. Our corporate technology team has also developed a plastic here. This is a conductive plastic that's totally thin and flexible. And they've already demonstrated that this can be cut into whatever shape they like and ironed onto a textile. So if you think about it, it's no more complicated than iron to deploy a particular antenna structure into a garment. That said, you still have to connect to it. And that connector is what we're working on. Thanks, Lorenzo, for the question. Thanks, Lorenzo. So talking a bit more about the connectivity and the technology, uh, Nick, what new types of sensors do you foresee uh, being in wearables? Yeah, it's, a, it's a big question. Um, I, I do expect, actually, there's others in the industry that are looking at this. And there's a lot of talk about chemical sensing, because mm -hmm. By being able to sense certain chemicals through the skin, you can tell a lot more about a person's health. So I think we're going to begin to see chemical sensors emerge in wearable devices, maybe in clothing as well. Not only can they sense things about the person, they can sense things about the environment. So uh, air quality monitoring is something that would be of interest to a lot of people, in different, certainly in different metro areas. But even, you know, if you're working in a particular room every day, you want to know, do I need to open a window? Do I need to get a breeze through here? What's my air quality like? So uh, being able to do the chemical sensing in wearable devices, being able to do air quality monitoring, any sort of biometric sensing is really going to have tremendous value. Because, you know, particularly in, in textiles, again, when you think about it, we're in contact with textiles most of our lives, whether it's clothing, whether it's upholstery, whether it's bedding, we're always in contact with textiles. The ability to measure things about our body is, is a big data dream come true. So it's an opportunity that I just think industry isn't going to let go by. We will figure out what sensors are the most valuable. We will figure out how to deploy them in these things in a way that makes it practically invisible to the user. And at the moment, we're working on how do we connect to these sensors. Well, as you said, wearables are chock full of sensors. Beyond sensing, what will wearables be doing in the future? Again, another great question with uh, lots of people are trying to guess at this. It could be that we move into a state in the future where, and actually I think this is probably coming relatively soon, where you have a wearable device that communicates to the cloud you have maybe a piece of smart clothing that communicates to the cloud, probably something you wear when you're working out. You have a car that communicates to the cloud, and maybe there's sensors built into the seat of the car, sensing things about you and what you're doing. Maybe there's sensors built into the steering wheel that are sensing how you're holding it. You'll also have, of course, your smartphone sensing where you're going during the day because you take that everywhere you go. And you'll begin to also have a smart home that, that is collecting about how you're sleeping, what you're eating from your fridge. That's a tremendous amount of data about each of us individually. I think in order for these things to be successful, they have to deliver something really useful to us as individuals. Tell us about our favorite subject, us. Tell us more about us. Um, I think what we can do is reach a point where all of these different pieces of our ecosystem are going to combine to start delivering 
real-time feedback to us. That is, uh, deliver us not a description of what we've done today. Deliver us a prescription of what we ought to do. Then the question is, well, who decides what we ought to do? That's the exciting part of the data science, is that you can look at your activities and see when is it that I'm performing my best? Um, what activities am I engaged in when I can say, no, that was really a good use of my time. I feel fulfilled. I feel like I'm doing the things I really need to do. For some people, that might be a week where they get to go to the gym five times, you know, once a day. For other people, it might be that they spend a lot of time with friends or family during that week. The point is, is that these devices need to help us understand that as individuals. Once they can do that and feed back to us what really works for us as individuals, that's when they start delivering a, a really exciting amount of value to our lives. So I can imagine a time when I'm having one of those weeks where uh, I'm, I really don't feel like I'm getting things done at work, where you know I haven't seen my friends in a while, I haven't done any of the activities I like to do, and my device might say, hey, you really need to take your wife out for a date. Or, hey, you haven't taken the kids to the park in a while. Or, you, know, you haven't stopped at a guitar store this week. And it make a recommendation knowing what it is that makes me happy, what makes me perform my best. I think that's really the promise of wearables. Uh, wearables as part of the IoT, one segment of the Internet of Things. It's going to get somewhere where we can expect the environment to tell us, we understand what makes you happy. This is a path to do it. Take this next step and this will keep you on that track for achieving your best results. But it'll be individualized and that's really the key. So what it, what it comes down to is our own personal metrics for happiness. These devices will be engaged in our pursuit of, of our own individual happiness, what makes us perform best. I think that's a really uh, just very exciting and inspiring goal to try and achieve and excited that we can be playing even just a small part of that. Thanks, Nick. So you definitely touched on the IoT, which is a very big uh, topic these days. Um, is there anything else you'd like to say about how wearable devices will interact with all the other smart things in our lives here in the future? Yeah, the I o, you know, IoT is such a huge term. It covers everything from security cameras to, to home systems to wearable devices even implantable devices. Uh, and that's a, that's a huge topic. But the way I like to think of it, particularly in our mission here on this team, is we're solving connection problems, connectivity problems that customers are struggling with in these new devices. And these devices are all taking different shapes and different forms. And that means their challenges are new. As we move into soft environments, you know, like clothing or like shirts, we have to solve new problems. But these aren't limited to wearables. You know, IoT devices can face some of the same challenges that they're fitting into new spaces or they're being deployed in new ways that require new connectivity solutions. As we work to develop a connector for a, a smart clothing application, that connector can solve a lot of problems in automotive where they may need to be connecting to the seats. Uh, it can work in military applications or in uh, you know first responder applications where they're trying to enable new things, cameras, um, wearable cameras for police departments. Um, so there's a broad implication for this across a lot of different industries. To me, it's all IoT. We, as a, as a group, work with some of the hardware accelerators here in the Bay Area. And that gives us a chance to see all of the, a lot of the really cutting edge smart devices that entrepreneurs are trying to come up with. And what's fascinating is almost every single one of them has a Bluetooth antenna. Almost every single one of them wants a better method for recharging their batteries. So between the data communication and the power connection, they all have needs. Now the exciting part, since we've brought sensors into the picture, is they all want to do different kinds of sensing. We've got some products right off the shelf that we can deliver to them, but we're also working to try to understand what else would they like to sense. Is there something we can combine with the sensor? that would bring them extra value. We were talking with a, a company just the other day about you know, this wireless power receiver, and they said, can we fit one of your heart rate monitors 
right in the middle of the coil. That's exactly the kind of feedback we're looking for. Is we can combine all of these different bits we have as a company, whether it's data or power or sensing, and we can put them into a new package that helps our customers achieve what it is they're trying to with the shape and function of their device. That's a, it's a increasingly complex challenge as industrial designers are just pushing the boundaries of what can be done. But it's also great, you know, to be working on this new stuff. It's a lot of fun. For sure. Uh, we actually had a question come in uh, from Kathy, but I wanted to ask you, what is the process, uh, what is TE's process for working with customers to develop solutions for their wearables? Well, um, it, a lot of it depends on the customer and what it is they're trying to do. So we have uh, this wearable team here in Menlo Park, and we're a group of mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, and textile engineers who are looking at our existing catalog of products, and how we deliver them to the market, trying to make sure we get the right products in the customer's hands, and also working to create custom solutions with customers to fit their particular needs. Some customers come and sit with us here in the lab and work side by side with us on certain projects, whether it's a custom charging cable or something else. Other customers uh, come to us and they want to provide us their complete system model so that we can look for all of the opportunities to optimize their design. So it, it works in different ways. Um, some of our team will go interface with the other engineering teams inside the company to help push a, a challenge through. Um, we have some wristband customers in San Francisco who uh, depend on us to help them characterize the antenna. But as we're doing the antenna design for them, we can figure out a lot of other ways of improving performance that touch on other parts of their system. So a customer might come to us for one thing, and it might turn out that we can actually help them in several other ways that they haven't perceived before. Having them interface with a team that's solely focused on wearable applications gives them a big advantage. It's much easier for them to interface with one group in here and have to meet with five or six different product managers separately and go through a discussion with each one of them. We're trying to look at their products and their systems holistically and look at the different ways things interact in order to improve their overall performance, kind of exceed their expectations in that way. Great, thanks Nick. Um, are there any other problems you're working on solving that you can discuss or show us maybe? There's a lot of other problems we're working on. So we mentioned wireless power, um, but as we've hinted at through the discussion here, a lot of what's coming into us is uh, soft goods applications. People want to do things in handbags or clothing or other soft environments, gloves, uh, even doing things that are going to be deployed in mattresses. And that creates a lot of interesting connectivity challenges. One thing we've been prototyping is wireless charging in a pocket. So you can drop a, a phone in here and it will begin to charge wirelessly. This is a pocket that's designed to take anything from an iPhone 4 up to a Samsung S6 and it'll start charging as long as it's got a wireless power receiver. Um, we've worked with other customers to begin scoping out what should textile connectivity look like. This is actually a textile sample with conductive threads in it that we built on our loom here in the lab. And we're just playing with different connector ideas and trying to understand uh, from our customer's perspective what's really going to be valuable to them and solve the biggest problem. Um, looking again at the wristbands, Pebble did something really radical with their new watch. They actually put a port on their watch to connect to the wristband, and they open sourced it. They let their developer community, uh, they gave them the pinout for the strap. They gave them even a, a connector model, which we 3D printed here and put on the strap. And they said, you know, maybe we don't know what the best use for the strap is, but we know our developer community will. So we've played with deploying wireless power in the strap, looking at integrating sensors into it. Um, I was just having a discussion with one of my colleagues in Pennsylvania today who's looking at building smart gloves for an application here in the TE factories and talking about adding sensing to them so that we can better understand 
what the actual assembly workers are doing and characterize which motions, which actual activities are the most productive and begin to, to uh, just proliferate those specific actions. Um, so that's kind of a, a cross section of some of the work we're doing. It's, it's really broad and the, the challenge really is understanding what to not work on at a given moment because all of it's cool, all of it's really cutting edge and we are starting to tease out some major trends across all of it, particularly this challenge of having to bridge hard and soft environments, whether it's sensors in a glove or, or batteries in a watch strap. They're all going to require a different kind of connector, and that's what our team is trying to invent. Great. Well, that is all the questions I have. Um, before we get to some of our viewers' questions, I just had to ask you, uh, looking at your t-shirt, can you tell us a little bit about spring fingers? What do they do? How are they related to wearables? For all of us wondering out here. Well, we talk about a lot of cool technologies, obviously wireless power, and we have, we have contactless data, and we have these conductive plastics. These are all really exciting new technologies. But we have something that's extremely successful in wearables and really is just a humble little engine of utility for our customers. And it's a spring finger. A spring finger is really nothing more than a bent piece of, a piece of metal that connects two parts of a system. It's uh, this beautiful little part that can, that can, let's say, connect an antenna to the rest of the system and the device. They're very small, so I'm going to attempt to show you them. On the Bluetooth antenna on the watch I, I showed earlier, I had an example of uh, the antenna. We used our own spring fingers in here to get the connectivity back down to the device. That's what a spring finger is. It's small. We have a really great platform of them to fit a single footprint, but a variety of heights. That makes it very useful for our customers. And our spring fingers are in a, a really surprising number of wearable devices. We can go into a customer and talk about some of this cutting edge technology and they get excited about it and we get excited about it, but the first thing they want to order is spring fingers. Okay, let's get them on the board and then let's start talking about the other technology. Great, spring fingers for everyone. All yes. right, now, <laughs> now I think we'll take some questions from the audience. Um, we have one here from Enrico. He asks, what, which is more state-of-the-art, smart textiles or wearable electronics? Oh, that's a good question. Hey. Um, frankly, I don't know how to answer that. You know, they're different in different ways. What's happening with wristbands, let's say, uh, is really tremendous. I mean, if you go back to, let's say, Pebble's first-generation watch, and you look how their product has matured, or you go to Samsung's first swipe at the watch, or even Motorola's version of the watch, you see something that may not be you know, the best for the most people, but it's just really amazing how much functionality we've packed into a tiny little device. It really is radical. And, you know, living in the Bay Area, we're probably a little bit biased, but as we walk around, you can see more and more wearables, whether it's a smartwatch or just an activity monitor, on every wrist you see. Like I say, we're probably skewed to, to be more uh, into the technology here, but it really is reaching a lot of different areas. Now you're seeing people's grandparents wearing Fitbits and whatnot. Um, so I think the impact, the social impact, that's starting with the, the wristbands is probably the most pronounced, but clearly in my mind, the opportunity for smart textiles to emerge, not for athletic applications, but just for everyday consumers. That's huge. I think as, as a parent, I would happily pay 15% more for my children's clothes if I could look on my phone anytime and see their heart rate, see their location. Uh, that'd be great. The other thing that, that people are looking at doing with clothing is adding haptics. And when you think about the ability to put some kind of response into clothing, rather it just being passive sensing, to actually add interaction or add haptics to it. It's a tremendous opportunity. There are some people experimenting with using haptics in garments 
to help treat ADD and other disorders that people have and other sensory conditions. That's pretty radical. Um, I also think as a guy who travels quite a bit for work, being able to send my kids a hug through a shirt would be awesome. If I know they're about to go to bed and I give myself a little squeeze, they're wearing a shirt, they feel that squeeze from dad who might be on the other side of the world, that's cool, that's very cool. So the opportunity to keep us uh, connected to one another through clothing, that just seems natural. I mean, if you think of, about the history of, of clothing and textiles, people making clothes for one another. I have, I have an Irish grandmother who knit a, a, did a cable knit sweater for me. Those are treasured things. You're just adding now a different layer of personal connection to some of these devices. So I think the implications of smart clothing can really sink into our lives in a much more meaningful way than the wristbands or the jewelry or the headsets or the other things that will that'll come out. That was a good question. Thank you for that. Thanks, Nick. Um, another one about wearable tech or wearable clothing from Josh. Um, he's wondering how far off we are from this being an affordable and scalable and mass-produced consumer product. I, I don't think we're very far at all. Um, I, I think the question is, what is it that consumers really want in these products? And that's what everybody's trying to find out. In athletics, it's easy to see. You want to monitor heart rate, you want to monitor breathing, you want to monitor muscle exertion. Have you really got the best workout you could get? Have you really pushed yourself as hard as you could push yourself? Um, I think when we figure out what it is that delivers the right value, what kind of sensing is it that delivers the right value to the average consumer, then we'll see it explode. And those economies of scale are huge. You know, in, in consumer electronics, we talk about the smartphone market being really a nice big market. It's what everybody aspires to, is that kind of numbers. In 2014, I think it was, uh, I think the number is about 1.2 billion smartphones were shipped. But it's estimated that in 2014, something like 12 billion t-shirts alone were made. So when you compare the size of the opportunity, and that's not including footwear, that's not including pants, so if you just begin to look at apparel in general as an opportunity to deploy sensing and start increasing functionality, um, that opportunity is so huge that the economies of scale can be realized very quickly. Even today, some of the uh, smart shirts or heart rate monitors that you wear as chest straps, the prices are beginning to fall very quickly. I think Gartner estimates that the, the price is going to fall as they do look out at the smart smart clothing industry, they're predicting that it's going to be 10% per year price erosion, or maybe even more if I'm remembering that correctly. So the prices will come down quickly as volumes pick up. The question is, who's going to be the first brand to figure out what the right product is for the consumer market? And I have no idea what that is, but it's going to be interesting working with people as they figure it out. Lots of different ideas about what it is are coming in from different directions. One example is uh, Google. Uh, they just completed something called Project Jacquard that we were very proud to be a part of. And uh, they, looked, they were actually really revolutionary in this idea that they looked at the textile not as a way to do passive sensing. They said this ought to be the means for device interaction, a way to interact with the machines. What they developed was a method of sensing in the garment. I think, I think initially they'll look at deploying it as on the sleeve. So you can imagine your Android device uh, ringing in your pocket rather than fish it out. You can do something simple like swipe your sleeve to send that to voicemail. But maybe it gets a little bit more interesting when you think it, you want to send a quick message to a loved one. So you can swipe to initiate voice activation and you can just dictate a text message. Their idea also is they might not know the right use for that technology, but they think the developer community will. I believe they're planning to issue this out as a development kit to people and just see what developers can do with it to play with it. They've already announced that they're working with Levi's to deploy this in a, uh, a denim jacket. And it's really a, a radical idea to think that the way I work with the machine is going to be through my clothing. That's that's lots of ways that can actually work out in time. It's a very interesting project. And we were, like I said, we were very happy to work with them. Thanks, Nick. 
So we have another question from Lorenzo regarding wireless charging. He asks, is there any work being done on how to power wearables using body heat? Paranormal electric energy harvesting. That's a great question. Um, yes, people have looked at it. It doesn't seem like it generates a ton of power. Um, everybody, when we talk about energy harvesting in the body, everybody looks right at the feet. There is a lot of energy generated by walking. So if we can put, oh, and people already have put energy harvesting into shoes, the question is, how do you get that somewhere where it's useful? Uh, there are researchers at Stanford, uh, one that comes to the name, uh, Ada Poon, A-D-A-P-O-O-N, did some work on skin conductance and understanding how you can actually pass electricity through the skin uh, without you know, endangering uh, an individual. So I think there is some work being done about how we can get energy harvested. I think that part is pretty well understood, but how do we get it to where it's needed is, the, is another question. That's why energy scavenging or RF energy harvesting is more, more interesting to me personally because that's something that you just pick up as you walk. So you can have, let's say, a, a sleeve on your phone that you add to your phone that has the energy harvesting built into it. It's probably not a great way to recharge a dead battery, but it is a good way to trickle charge your battery and keep it closer to full more of the time, really just extend battery life. Um, but and that actually brings up the question of batteries. What kind of batteries are we going to see emerge in, in smart clothing in particular? Um, you know, batteries as they are most of the time are flammable and dangerous if you, if you expose them to the wrong elements. There are companies out there like Imprint Energy, for one here in the Bay Area, that are, are working at with battery technologies that are inherently very thin, flexible, and are capable of being deployed in something like a textile that have a lot of potential and could really help advance this. Um, so there's a lot of different pieces of it coming together. I think the energy harvesting part of it will probably take another three years for the right use of it, the right way to deploy it, the right way to get the power where it's needed to really emerge. But it's something that we are we are spending time with. Thanks again, Lorenzo. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, that was interesting. The last question here is from Artem. Um, going back to wearables and the IoT, he asks, um, you know, we have smartwatches and now smart textiles. Do you have any idea how the market will evolve next? Um, what's the very next step? Well, if you think about what we're doing with smart textiles, it's sensing in a soft environment. If you can do it in clothing and apparel, it means you can do it in upholstery, you can do it in carpets, you can do it in drapes, you can do it in bed sheets. I think beginning to see intelligence added to these objects that we really just take for granted in the background of our lives is, is sort of what's next with that. On the watch front, I think we are gonna see traditional watchmakers pick up extra intelligence, just like Mondan is doing with full power uh, and adding sensing to traditional Swiss watches. I think we're gonna see that. So it might look like a classic product, but they've added extra functionality and intelligence to it. I think these two trends are just gonna continue and the brands will figure out really what is the thing that excites consumers most and gets the most attention, the most traction in the market. And we'll see them proliferate naturally I think we also might see that some of the activity trackers that we wear with wristbands today, that functionality is either going to move completely into the smartphone or it's going to move into our clothing. But I think we will see a time when just wearing a pure activity tracker on your wrist might go because it's redundant. You have that in other places already. And, you know, uh, Sunny Vu of Misfit Wearables always talks about the, the smartphone test that, you know, if you leave your smartphone at home, you're going to turn around and go get it. If you leave your wristband at home, are you really going to turn around and get that? And I think we haven't quite reached the point where those devices are going to cause you to turn around and come back. When it's in your clothing, you don't have to worry about it anymore. When the functionality is in your smartphone, you don't have to worry about it. So it's going to be a, a race to see who creates the most compelling experience for the user that makes these new technologies just an integral part of what we're already doing in our daily lives. 
Right, thanks, Nick. Thanks, everyone, for your questions. Um, I think that about does it for us today. But thanks again, Nick. Nick Langston, Jr. out of Menlo Park, California, in TE's wearables lab. And if you want any more information about uh, what TE is doing with wearables, you can visit te.com slash wearables. Again, thanks so much. You're welcome.